Uh, anytime we're in the same room, like an OSCE meeting, whenever the Russians are going to talk, uh, the Europeans and Americans stand up and walk out of the room. I mean, this is so childish. Like, absurd. It's and, childish. Uh, childish, yeah. But this is what you see when uh, when uh, the ability, if you create that an ideal, uh, universal ideal, which can uh, essentially save humanity, transcend conflict, and then you link it to, oh, it's dependent on our hedge money. Now you're going to see that these ideals of peace, which are good values, but being used, uh, weaponized to go after other countries. This is what we do. Uh, we create new wars as well. We we don't interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries. We have democracy promotion. <laughs> we don't invade governments. We have uh, humanitarian interventions. We don't topple government. Well, we have we support democratic revolutions. So this is uh, as Orwellian as it gets. We just make up new words and fill it with uh, yeah ridiculous content, and uh, no one can criticize it because who, who's against the democratic revolution? Who's against humanitarianism? So it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's sloganary. It's not uh, debate, and it's not foreign policy. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got with me again Dr. Glenn Deason, who's a professor at the University of South Norway and an associate editor of the journal Russia in Global Affairs. His research focuses on Russian foreign policy and political economy. Usually we talk quite a lot about the many books that he wrote, but today I'm very happy to share with you that Glenn also has his own YouTube channel that is growing and getting bigger. So if you enjoy Glenn's analysis, please go over. It's under his own name and subscribe to that one. Uh, today we're going to do an update on what's happening in Europe, Russia and uh, world affairs. So Glenn, thank you very much for joining me again. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again, Pascal. Um, yeah, so the world was pretty crazy the last two weeks, I would say, because there was all of this French talk of boots on the ground in Ukraine. And there was, a, in my view, a real danger of actual escalation and, you know, a spillover of, of this. And the Russians actually did this uh, um, nuclear drill. And, and they also they outrightly threatened, if you put boots on the ground, we might attack your troops, even in, in Romania. I mean, all things are off, like nuclear, uh, like, nuclear strike and also st uh, strikes against NATO facilities in NATO territory. And by now, it seems as if though NATO is actually saying like there will be no boots on the ground. Um, are we at the at the point of de-escalation now? Yeah, possibly. Again, it's not clear what the motivations of uh, the French are because uh, part of the rhetoric as well is that we shouldn't take anything off the table because if we limit ourselves uh, then, uh, you know, Russia can, uh, well, it makes us very predictable and this can be to Russia's advantage. So this, uh, um, it, to me, it first sounded a little bit like uh, Nixon's madman strategy, you know, when he uh, suggested, uh, you know, it's good if our adversaries think we're, uh, well, if it's uh, unpredictable what we might do, because then they're less likely to test us and poke us. So it, it, this could be, be merely what Macron was trying to do. They was trying to have this uh, clever uh, geopolitical uh, ploy. But at the same time, one has to also point out that Macron, uh, you know, he's threatening now effectively to uh, go to direct war against Russia. And this happens at the same time as in Britain, you have David Cameron, arguing that, uh, you know, here, we're going to give you long distance missiles. If you want to strike the inside Russian territory, go ahead. You know, this is, uh, this is, you know, your prerogative. We're not going to tell you what to do. And from uh, the American side, uh, we heard Blinken say something similar. That is, uh, in the past, they put a conditions on the weapons, don't uh, hit the inside Russian uh, territory. But now uh, they're giving long distance weapons and, you know, how Ukraine used them is up to them. So uh, th th this has kind of been the main escalation. You know, we um, the the line between uh, proxy war and direct war keeps narrowing, and uh, obviously for Russia they reacted quite uh, negatively because they at some point have to uphold their red lines. Uh, you know where is this all going to end? One day NATO's pilots going to fly NATO planes taking off from NATO territory. You know, bombing Russian cities and, and Russia still going to be deterred not to do anything. So, you know, this 
Well, and again, this isn't my words. So, you know, remember Biden himself said sending F-16 could be the start of World War III. We're never going to do that, and now we're doing it. So at some point, uh, Russia will feel very compelled to strike back uh, to restore deterrence. And uh, I think this is what they're communicating, like if that they might now start to hit uh, NATO territory as well, or at least British targets uh, outside of Ukraine, and at the same time holding this... Uh, tactical nuclear weapons drills so sending a clear signal that uh, this is yeah this is where we have drawn our line and this is where we'll fight so uh hopefully well not hopefully but it seems as if uh, the the turret has worked because now of course uh macron started walking back some of the things he had said and uh, so hopefully this is uh, de-escalation but i guess this is where we are we never fought a proxy war like this before where we're kind of shifting the boundaries, what is permitted, what is not permitted. Uh, we kind of had this agreement, you know, Russia can't hit uh, NATO troops uh, uh, outside Ukraine. They can hit them in Ukraine. And the same goes with NATO. They can supply the weapons intelligence to hit Russia inside Ukraine. And this is more or less where the rules are starting to move. And now these rules are being challenged as NATO escalates. And uh, so it's a very dangerous game we're playing, and the absence of rules, of course, is so we're making up the rules as we go along. This makes it uh, all the more dangerous. This is, you know, this is what von Clausewitz said: like a war pushes you to the extremes. It constantly pushes you to do to one up the other, and that's this escalation spiral. And that's not just in this war. I mean, we've seen how we've had this shadow war going on before, at least fifteen years of uh, expansion, not expansion. Ukraine neutral, not neutral. And this has been constantly pushed. And this escalation spiral is now continuing. And I cannot get over, and I think you're the right person to talk uh, uh, to talk about this too. I cannot get over the fact that we are in Europe now on a straight path to a fifth general war in 400 years. Your book, you know, you, you're the one who points out that the Westphalian system, uh, 1648, that, that, was, uh, that that's still the system that we are living in, and that's the one thing that hasn't changed. But this war before 1648, the Thirty Years' War, that was a huge catastrophe for Europe, huge. And from then, we keep doing that in very regular intervals, um, our stupid continent. Um, are we in that spiral again, or is this is this purely political? Because I also see this this problem that in the media in Europe, there seems to be something like war euphoria going on, as in war is inevitable. It's a question of when, not 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 if. Is that still the case at the moment? How do you perceive the entire like social response in Europe to this current situation, where now Ukraine is is evidently evidently losing? No, I think this is a sentiment that war is unavoidable is uh, is, is very problematic, and this is how the state seems to be react, uh, acting as well. That is, uh, the Europeans suggesting that we're going to be in war with Russia in the future, so it's better to fight this out in Ukraine because now at least we can fight with Ukrainians and uh, we can keep some distance. But uh, but actually, you see to some extent the uh, same in in Russia because they see obviously this uh, NATO rolling into Ukraine, using this as a proxy, as a, a dagger against the heart of Russia, as an existential threat. So so what 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 are they going to do as well? So they they also have the uh, idea that it's better to fight this now here because uh, if uh, NATO gets to entrench itself in Ukraine. Uh, you know, they can completely cut the Russians off the Black Sea. They, they would have a huge strategic advantage. So, yeah, this will be the end of Russia. So it's better to fight this now uh, because it's a better better place to fight than later, which is why <laughs> this is also so very dangerous. I, I, I often use the example of a you know, on, on the battlefield, you see there's two different uh, tactics you can use. Uh, usually when you encircle the adversary, if it's a heavily entrenched area, often you leave an opening so that troops can can pull out and then you don't have to fight for this territory. Other times you close up completely and then want to annihilate or capture the enemy. Well, this is kind of what we're doing politically. We have uh, not, well, with NATO uh, surrounding surrounding Russia and, and also the policy in, in Ukraine, because what we're saying is there's uh, there's no way out. We we closed all diplomatic avenues, and we're saying the only way out is for Russia to capitulate. That means 
uh, withdraw completely, even abandoning Crimea, which would then end up in the hands of NATO, which again is an existential threat to Russia. They can never accept this. And uh, so, uh, so we effectively told the Russians, this is it. Now we will fight it till the end. And Russia can't capitulate. This is either the way they see it, uh, you know, victory or death. So it's we, we we put ourselves in a very horrible strategic position. And uh, and uh, this is why also it, it it reminds me often of the 1648 or the 30-year the war, war that preceded it, because the main problem there was we were all slaughtering each other uh, in, in this total war because everyone thought that uh, peace can only be established when there's one dominant force left. In other words, uh, peace has to be dependent on the hegemon. And, um, but the alliances kept shifting, uh, so no one power was able to establish dominance. And at the end, after we you know, burned down our whole continent in the worst war we had, uh, we all decided, okay, let's find a diplomatic solution. Now, we seem to be moving in the, that direction now, but of course the weapons are much more terrifying now, and uh, uh, we usually have these huge political agreements to adjust to a new political reality. They emerge after major wars, but this this is the first time we really have to be able to reach the diplomacy before the war, because uh, it's very likely we won't survive this war, which... Uh, might be coming. So it's a dangerous time. And as we mentioned, the propaganda is very fierce, uh, which creates this uh, war enthusiasm. Uh, I, this is why I think, yeah, propaganda is it, a chapter of its own in this uh, in this war. It definitely is. It's, it's something that helps shape this entire thing. But that's why, you know, uh, I don't view this whole thing anymore as just the 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 greedy neocons uh, who try to have a proxy war uh, because of the military industrial complex or just uh, Russia that tries to put put boundaries there. We are in a social conflagration in which uh, dozens of factors start creating a a war scenario and they we, we build the war socially right now right around us and that that's also that that it includes the mentality because at the end of the day in order to fight a big war what you need is millions of people who are willing to go <laughs> take the weapons and go right and we know that in inside ukraine we already have that one and but we're we are still working on creating the conditions socially all of us together to make that possible um now my <laughs> One thing that plays into this and why, why 1648 is so important is that the, the, the 30 years war was very much also about ideology. It was about who who gets to make the rules. Is it the church or is it the state? And in the end, the, 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 the dice fell for the state and the church lost all power and this ideology went away. It took 300 years, but it more or less it less it faded away. Um and 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 state power took over. Now, what I see at the moment is that we have of the three global great powers, uh, Russia, China, and the United States, we have two which are clearly in the realist camp, uh, which clearly I think perceive the world in realist terms and also in, in like threat perception and so on. But we have the United States and the European satellites, who are, in my view, horribly captured in something like a post-religious frenzy of perceiving everything as you know in in terms of good and evil the the original the original you know the conceptualization of the world in 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 christian terms uh good democracies versus evil autocracies and there is no there's no negotiating with the devil the devil needs to be defeated um do you do you uh, could you agree to this uh, uh or like how do you how do you see this I, the, the the component of ideology playing into um the current conflagration well, ideology is important because, uh, again, a world order or an international system is based on two components. It's the international distribution of power. That is, do you have a hegemon? Do you have a, uh, many centers of power that balance each other? This is a key component, but it's also uh, this is also reflected in, um, in, in, in values. So uh, a hegemon requires uh, universal values, so legitimizing the rule of others. So you mentioned the... the the, the, the church obviously the the Catholic Church uh, you know had the had the authority to essentially represent all all Christians so all of Europe so then you have the dom you have the concentration of power plus the universal values uh, to to legitimize how you're imposing yourself on the others that there's only one real sovereign and this is uh, and this is also 
uh, something that's probably had to resolve because once we realized there couldn't be one hegemon with many centers of power, we also had to complement this then with uh, the idea that uh, you know the Catholic Church doesn't rule over others. So you you recognize the uh, the distinctiveness of each country, um, and once you re recognize civilizational cultural distinctiveness that we all have our own different path to development, then that undermines the universal claim to represent other peoples. Now we have often had many universalist. Uh, often they can be under the banner of idealist internationalism. So under the French Revolution, they say we have universal values, now we will give it to everyone. So sovereignty diminishes. Uh, the Bolsheviks did the same, of course. They say, you know, we have this value, uh, universal values of human freedom, now we're going to go to the rest of the world and uh, we'll, we'll also spread it. Uh, come to freedom of others. And this is what uh, we've done in the past 30 years as well. We say, you know, we have a liberal democratic value, it's very universal. We all follow the same path to development. We will help you along. And uh, this, uh, again, back, if, uh, has the same function as the Catholic Church uh, back in the 17th century. We, um, we, we have, this um, legitimizes the concept of only one real sovereign, which is the political West, because we are, we already have the liberal democracy, so but the others do not. So we're the civilized, they are the barbarians, so we will help them along. And um, yeah, so, and with this, as we mentioned, the good versus evil is where the propaganda comes in because uh, we don't discuss key issues anymore. We just have uh, uh, these concept, this concepts uh, and all our concepts, they're all great, you know, freedom, democracy, and but they're all empty vessels. There's nothing, and we, we fill it with, with whatever we want. And as we've seen in Ukraine, uh, what we fill it with is all nonsense. It's, uh, it's things which contradicts it. But but it helps us because in propaganda, you want to communicate in slogans and phrases reflecting the struggle between good and evil. And uh, But this is something we didn't start now. We've been doing this since the 90s. And it's, uh, yes, yeah, quite uh, alarming. The interesting thing is that it's the, the entire, the, this is a pseudo religious uh, dogma is coming apart in front of our eyes that is so glaring that it's just interesting that it, there's still the hardcore believers that can go along with it especially if you we, when we now start comparing everything that happened in Ukraine with everything that's happening in Gaza right where allegedly the good guys the democratic guys are the ones who killed 40,000 Palestinians in a ghetto uh, the length of a marathon uh, six uh, six kilometers wide uh, or or ten, and the where an entire population is captured and and men and women are dying. And if I say forty thousand people are dying, like half of them are children under the age of eighteen. And those the people who kill those people are the ones that are hailed as like literally, you know, the only democracy in the Middle East is that catchphrase, right? That slogan. <laughs> and if you compare that to 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 Ukraine, where we were told that Russia is 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 committing unspeakable crimes against civilian population, and it took the Israelis about two months to reach the same civilian death toll as it took the Russians, or that that it took in 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 the the uh, Ukraine Russia war to get to that civilian death toll. And by now they're way above it, although the 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 war in Ukraine has lasted for two years. So you must any normal thinking person must come to the conclusion either uh, Israel is is extremely horrible in and and horribly abusing human rights and everything and, and and international humanitarian law or the russians respect it very much either of the two must be true right um but yeah. that's not how it works to the ideologues is it no and and this is the thing because when you're talking about good versus evil then it uh, it, it limits the the scope for facts so for example <clears throat> uh let, let's just look at the when the russians invaded uh ukraine they uh, the Americans dropped more bomb on Iraq the first yeah. day than the Russians did on the first month. And also, if you look at the civilian casualties in the Ukraine, where it's actually uh, remarkably low compared to uh, almost all other conflicts. Now, these are just facts, and uh, it, it can't be denied; it can be proven. But you can't say them because if you say it, then you're you're, you're supporting you're seen as supporting the, this side. So. We're committed to this ideology that well, they're they're the bad guy, we're the good guy. So this kind of even though these are proven facts, it legitimizes a, an invasion by evil, and so you can't say it. But but this is why I mentioned before that we use these concepts, this uh, this uh, virtuous great ideals, and we hollow them out and uh, fill them with anything. And we saw this already in the nineties. 
you know, when we started integrating, having this uh, um, idea of European integration, wonderful, right? Everyone likes European integration. It's a great theme, but we don't unpack it. It's a, you know, Europe is a contested concept. So the British, for example, said, listen, is there a good idea to transfer sovereign powers from elected democracies to an unelected bureaucracy far away in Brussels? This is a reasonable debate to have, but how do we respond? No, more Europe, not less. Europe is good, anti-Europe is bad, and you know, feel how you want about the Brexit. But this would have been a, a good conversation to have, and you know, a reasonable one. And the, and we saw the same with the Russians. They said, you know, we talk about European integration. What does it mean? It means uh, we move dividing lines to the east. Uh, the largest state in Europe, Russia, would they have to decouple? We have to decouple their neighbors from them. And if you have too much economic integration between Germany and Russia, the two largest economies in Europe now, this is bad for Europe, as Brzezinski told us. This undermines European integration. So we have, you know, surely, yeah, there's two sides of this uh, discussion, and a debate can be had. But the point is, we don't have debates. We have this. Uh, the, the, this is slogans, and uh, so, um, uh, so, so so I think this is a problem. And you saw the same in Ukraine. We're saying, listen, uh, Ukraine should have sovereignty, freedom, uh, allowed to choose its own foreign policy. Wonderful. Everyone would sign up for this. So certainly, I would. But uh, but these are very abstract concepts. And again, you can fill this <laughs> this uh, vessel simply with any content. So. You know, we toppled a democratically elected government there in an un unconstitutional coup against the will of the majority of Ukrainians. It's a democratic, democratic revolution. You know, we uh, supported uh, the, the, the attacks on Donbass, uh, purged their political opposition, their media, uh, supported arresting the main opposition leader, um, overturning the, the elections they had in Ukraine when they voted for a peace platform because, as the Americans say, this is simply capitulation to Moscow. It will help the Ukrainians not to uh, have to capitulate, even though the vast majority voted for a peace platform. So always we do, we have this idea of helping freedom and democracy, and we put all kind of nonsense in there, which has nothing to do with it. And this is uh, and this is why we can't have discussions because we just speak in these slogans. So if you say, well, perhaps you know there are, uh, we should respect the Ukrainian elections and implement the peace platform. No, well, you know, then you're supporting Russian imperialism. So, you know, we're so so we we there's no real discussion said. Anyway. No, there's not. But I think I think <clears> we <throat> we lost the capacity for that. As in, not just not just to say like, oh, let's blame Ursula and 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 Borrell and and Schultz. I I think we lost the ability to actually um to to even perceive uh, and 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 discuss these issues because immediately if you do the media would crack down on you or or other factions would crack down on you so each actor in the system knows exactly the boundaries that they that they can wiggle in and that wiggle room is not big enough to actually wiggle into an, a, a discussion so we have a sociological moment where where and I, um, where discussion ain't possible anymore. And you know this. Um, I talked to to Balash Orban the other day, and that 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 discussion will go online here. Like he's the he's the advisor to Viktor Orban, and he actually says like at the moment his assessment is, um, Europe is too weak to actually negotiate anything with Russia because they can't. They're they're just not able to. It's, it would have to be the Americans with the Russians to sit down and and strike a a, a big deal about about this thing. Do you do you agree to that? Uh, yes, and, and I, th I don't think Europe can do much anyway, uh, much negotiations now anyways. It has to be either between the Russians and the Ukrainians if the Ukrainians decide that, wait a second, I think we've been being used here as a pawn, uh, but that would require a new government in place. And I think they're too dependent on America now to be able to do this. So otherwise, it's the, it has to be the Americans negotiating. But again, this is not their continent, so they don't really have that much cost as, you know, when Hillary Clinton called for making Ukraine into a new Afghanistan, uh, uh, it's not their continent becoming Afghanistan. So it's, uh, it's uh, they, they don't, and, so, and they're fighting as they keep, their political leaders keep saying, they're fighting with Ukrainians, they're hardly losing any of their own troops and they're getting too weak in Russia. So they don't have the, the incentives. So the Americans don't have the incentives, the Ukrainians don't have the proper sovereignty anymore and the Europeans have simply become too weak, but but I agree. I think we by using this uh, propaganda slogans, this good versus evil. It's uh, 
uh, again, this is an old truth. It's always great when you want to mobilize for war, but once it's time to make peace, it's very difficult because we paint ourselves in this corner where we said something's evil. And, you know, before you mentioned... Uh, Wiggle room. Well, dumbing everything down, down with the slogans in, in, sorry, in, in, in oh. Gaza. And we had the same, we had the same problem there. Like there's a lot of, you know, all these protests now against the massacres occurring there. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you support Israel or support Palestinians or whatever. It's certainly this warrants a, a proper de debate and, uh, you know, dissent is quite reasonable. I would assume if you're protesting what the ICJ now refers to as a possible genocide. However, so what what do we do? Do we have a sensible discussion about foreign policy, the right of civil disobedience? No, we create again new concepts everyone agrees on. So we're against terror, we're against hate, we're against anti-Semitism. So you have this concept and you fill it with new content. So, well, if you criticize the way what's happening to the Palestinians, well, you might be an anti-Semite. You hate the Jews, you support terrorists, you're pro-Hamas. And this is, you know, this we do the same with the Russians. We, you know, if you criticize NATO's role in provoking the war and sabotaging peace agreements, well, then you're pro-Putin. You're supporting invasion. You hate Ukrainians. Uh, you know, you're legitimizing war. So we, it's there's not a debate. We just do these slogans, as you said, based on this good versus evil, uh, in which you can only have one take pick one side and uh, you know parrot the same phrases. Otherwise, you will be yeah, as you also said. Uh, crucified in the media so it's um it's not a good uh, place this to is be. what that what to me what i call the logic of war you know the thing if you have a war you need to go through all of these steps in order to make war possible and it is it's it it, it it plays on people's minds and 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 then group and and creates dynamics in groups that make that 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 lead you and push you toward war um the the thing i wonder is the the Russians seem to understand that because I read this paper by uh, Karaganov and and Trenin in in Russia and Glo global affairs where they they actually speak about uh, shaking the the Europeans until they wake up until they understand that this is not a game and that this is not that that these empty slogans they they will land everybody all of us the Russians included in a nuclear in a nuclear holocaust but uh, you can't get out of that. Unless, unless there's a there's a there's a perception and awareness for actual danger, and I don't I don't I don't completely ag agree with Karaganov um, because he seems to be on the very belligerent side on 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 on, on with the Russians. But it's interesting that they seem to perceive that as well that Europe is actually actually endangering itself very very much at the moment. And how how what are your observations about the Russian analysis of how the Europeans are acting? No, I understand. Well, I understand the argument of uh, Karagnov, that is that the uh, nuclear deterrent, which is what uh, has been a source of stability and peace that we never fought directly against each other, uh, has been severely weakened. We don't fear a nuclear war anymore. Uh, but even, but this is also part of the, 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 the propaganda and corruption of language, because we don't talk about nuclear deterrent anymore. Uh, Russia's nuclear deterrent, what we call it now, we call it nuclear blackmail, and you can never give in to blackmail. So, so the, we were categorically rejecting the nuclear deterrent, which has kept, uh, which, which has been the foundation for the peace between the nuclear powers. So it, it is quite. This is why I'm arguing the propaganda is quite uh, dangerous. But uh, so Karagno's argument is effective. We have to reduce the threshold for nuclear weapons to now clearly communicate to the Russian, now to the Europeans and the Americans that uh, you know, if you think you can. Uh, uh, well, essentially go to war against us and just pretend it's supporting Ukraine, that this is not going to work. And it's uh, obviously, I, I think the Americans, it sounds very hawkish, and I think it is hawkish, but I think the Americans would certainly do the same thing. I mean, imagine if the Russians or the Chinese topple the government in Mexico uh, to, you know, pull it into a, a Chinese-Russian alliance and America intervened, they began to send long-distance weapons to strike into American cities. Surely the Americans would communicate deterrent, uh, seek to elevate their nuclear deterrent by lowering the threshold, uh, lowering the threshold meaning, you know, uh, more avenues for legitimizing their use. But um, I, I was, I was in this uh, annual uh, Valdai meeting in Sochi last October, and uh, Karagno was there as well, and uh, and, and Putin then uh, told Karagno that you know he. 
he, he found this to be too destabilizing. We can't slow the threshold like we. Uh, so he understood the argument Putin said of Karagno, but uh, he didn't want to. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't want to go down this path. But of course, since the October, many things have changed. As you said, we're going to send troops now. We're giving uh, long distance missiles. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's again we use this idea: we we should help Ukraine defend itself. Wonderful. Of course, Ukraine has the right to defend itself. But this concept, again, is hollowed out. Well, what are we doing? We're the one sending uh, the weapons. We're giving the intelligence where, where, where you can strike. We're doing the war planning, as Newland has admitted. Uh, I've, I've spoken now to many who make the point that uh, a lot of the complex weaponry, you actually have NATO a military advisor even pull, pulling the trigger. Uh, and as we saw during this great uh, counteroffensive during the summer by the Ukrainians, the, even the military leaders said, oh, we don't, we don't want to do this. Uh, and uh, the Americans effectively, and they said that the Americans and NATO were pressuring them into doing this disastrous counteroffensive. And, uh, and and their argument was, uh, you know, the Americans, as I said in Washington Post, uh, they were coming too casualty averse. They were too afraid of taking large casualties. But it's because it's not our troops. We're fighting with Ukrainians. Of course, we're not casual uh, averse. But the whole point is, this is our war. And it's been our war since 2014 as well. Uh, and you know, it's already been revealed. So, uh, sorry, just very briefly, this was the New York Times article where they pointed out that uh, after we toppled their government and the Americans, you know, handpicked a new government to come in, from the first day, the new intelligence chief who was taking over in Ukraine, again, picked by the Americans, the first thing he did was call the CIA and MI6 to have a trilateral partnership against Russia, to do campaigns against Russia, establishing CIA bases along the and, border with Russia. And we need to emphasize so this is, this is New too. York Times. This is not some some yeah. conspiracy <laughs> Russian like newspaper. This is the New York Times that admits this, which was very surprising. It was very surprising that that was there. But it seems that there's some logic in the in the US that says like, no, at the moment, it helps us if we show just how much we support Ukraine. But this is this is it's insane that we at the same time pretend that no NATO is you know NATO only helps and at, on, on the other hand we know now that NATO like directs most a, a good part of what is happening with intelligence with target picking with probably the high mars system or which i mean there are systems that are we we don't know but we 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 suspect that they need substantial input from actual NATO personnel in order to be operational right um, and we, and the pretense is still that this is, you know, it's just helping the Ukrainians and the general public believes it or seems to believe it. Yeah, but they give you this binary choice. You can either uh, yeah. <clears throat> say that uh, we're just helping and uh, NATO's not part of the conflict, uh, we're just uh, giving weapons so Ukraine can defend itself, or you're taking the side of the Russians. Now you can choose yes. one of those camps. So if you begin to try to unpack what this concept of helping actually means, if this actually means that uh, we're the one who went to war against Russia using the Ukrainians, then uh, then you're on the side of the Russians, and of course you will also then be have your uh, you know be, be be crucified in the media as well. So this is uh, and how it's it is. interesting that this works on basically on both sides. This psychological um, narrowing down of of what's right and what's wrong because it excludes the possibility that two things can be true at the same time. It's not possible that uh, Russia has legitimate security concerns and that Russia uh, illegally invaded uh, Ukraine. You know, if if it's illegal, then it doesn't have legitimate security concerns. If, if you if you argue it has legitimate security concerns, then it cannot, uh, you know, uh, then, then, then it must be legal for them to to invade, and that's something that I also hear on the other side. You know that um, Russia had to in, had to go in with its special military uh, operation because uh, it was it was pushed, you know, and because of the of the of that, it was not illegal. It was legal, and of course, Russia is also also very very good at um, creating legal arguments. So, in terms of their their chain of events with recognizing the Donbas republics, and in order to them ask ask Russia for, for support, uh, and then collective self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter. This is a very, very cogent way of justifying uh, what happened. But we are losing the the ability of saying, yes, two contradictory things can actually both be true, and we just need to deal with the situation that we created.
Yeah, but this is the problem of good versus evil. All ruins disappears. And uh, and this was this has been an argument all along as well. For example, if you look at the Crimea, uh, the idea that uh, NATO US troops were going to come into Crimea and replace the, uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, this is an existential threat to Russia. They uh, they have very reasonable uh, concerns about this. And uh, and uh, but uh, also that retaking Crimea, I also believe it was against international law. So it doesn't both true at the same time. You, you don't have to. Yeah, it's both can be true. You don't have to. You know, we don't have to pre always pretend this. This is always uh, uh, you know good and evil, uh, right and wrong, black and white. But it was also the same with the general approach of NATO. This idea that you can expand the military bloc closer and closer to the Russian borders, topple the governments if they don't join voluntarily, and this is somehow. Russia has no legitimate security concerns. I mean, look at the rhetoric we had over the past 30 years. When have you ever watched a TV channel or a news segment or read a newspaper where we actually discuss Russian security concerns? If you if you want security, you have to recognize the security concerns of your adversary. It, you, you can't do that, at least not in this country, because if you discuss their, the legitimate security concerns, then you're legitimizing how they uh, try to uphold them. And, and but this is nonsense. I, I think that NATO expansion into Ukraine is a legitimate uh, threat to Russia. Even I quite empathize with the idea that's an existential threat, but it doesn't mean that I supported the invasion of Ukraine. But but uh, again, it, it doesn't work here because you have to you have to pick one one camp, uh, and uh, everything has to be black and white. So yeah. it, it, that's what I meant. It's very very heavily. This way, people who don't think in black and white, for us, it's relatively clear that the best path for Ukraine would have been a neutral and federal uh, new, neutrality to the outside and a federal structure on the inside, in order to make sure that that the, the forces don't don't push. Uh, the, the state apart, and that from the outside, Ukraine then has this important function, which neutral states have always had, which is being a buffer zone and, and de-escalate the security uh, mm -hmm. dilemma. And, you know, the security dilemma is usually only meant for weapons, right? If this state create, makes more weapons, then this one feels insecure, so makes more weapons, then this one feels insecure. But it's actually the same with military alliances. Adding new members to military alliance is an escalation, and then the other one will somehow react, right, in order to offset the the increased danger that's now coming from there. And the, the, a neutral spaces de-escalate that part of the security dilemma. But this was officially, officially, now we know, chosen not to happen. I had uh, this question to me for a long time. Why did neutrality for Ukraine not become the obvious solution? We now know because it was decided by the West that this is not wanted. We don't want it. Uh, we want to push. We Pushing is better. And and at, the, at one point, the Russians will break. And even when they don't break, we, we put sanctions until they break. So the, the miscalculation was that the Russians didn't break. But it was it was actively, this was actively prevented as a solution, as a mechanism to solve the conflict. Um, your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, the, well, the, I, well, it goes back to the idea of a sovereign and free Ukraine. And again, this is something I would support, but then you have to say what creates a sovereign independent Ukraine. And my, my main argument will be, uh, one that doesn't, uh, develop excessive dependence on one side. Uh, in other words, my my ideal for Ukraine would be to be militarily neutral, but economically diversify its ties. That is, not to be too dependent on Russia. If it's all its eggs in the Russian basket, it, it could be absorbed, uh, at least de facto. Uh, so this is not great. So he wants to trade a bit with the Russians, with the Americans, the Chinese, the Europeans. If you diversify, then uh, none of the major powers can use this economic dependence to impose itself politically and undermine your security and your political independence. So this is the economic uh, diversification and the military neutrality. I think is is very important. Uh, but this is not. Uh, but this is not how the EU uh, filled this concept of a, of a sovereignty. They said no, no, no. Sovereignty means you join the West. Uh, and decoupled from Russia. And again, in 2013, at the end of the year, when we were trying to destabilize uh, Ukraine very heavily uh, to topple the government, uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians came forth and they said, let's have a trilateral agreement. Ukraine doesn't have to choose. We have an agreement with Russia and with EU. We can be a bridge and not a front line. And the EU said, uh, the Barroso, the EU president, uh, the, no, no, this is unacceptable. Russia said yes uh, to that. To Russia's, being... Russia's, Russia's offer was not exclusive. Yeah. The EU offer was exclusive. 
Well, what does the thing? Because uh, and we call, but, but this is so. What, what we called for was an exclusive sphere of influence, and and my point is this is the worst for Ukraine because now they make themselves a front line in, against Russia. So Russia will then uh, find a way of uh, mitigating or re re eliminating this threat, which is why they launched the invasion. Meanwhile, Ukraine becomes overly dependent on the West. I mean, especially now with with this uh, war, the, the, the Americans are now picking out uh, their, their top officials. You even have American citizens uh, from the State Department taking who took key roles, like the finance minister position in Ukraine. So they already absorbed a lot of their uh, a lot of their independence and sovereignty economically. You know, Ukraine is now owned by the NATO countries. They uh, and you know they will start to collect interest very soon, as BlackRock just said this week. It's time to start paying interest on the loans we gave you. So uh, economically, security, they, they only lean to one side. And this means now they will be more and more defined as a proxy. And this is also my concern for Europe, because I think uh, I would think of myself as pro-European. But what does pro-European mean? You avoid excessive dependence on one side. You diversify. Uh, but, but what are we doing? We are... <clears throat> we are... Uh, uh, cutting ourselves off, uh, you know, Russian energy, Chinese technologies, avoiding excessive dependence only on the United States. And you will see our economic competitiveness weaken. You will see our political autonomy diminish. And uh, in, in this country, in, in Norway, we're now going to, after uh, having a no base policy in the country, we're opening now uh, many American bases. Uh, and uh, is, we're effectively outsourcing our policy towards Russia because the Americans uh, don't have the same interests as us necessarily. They want to confront the Russians in the Arctic. So now we're becoming, in my opinion, a front line uh, against uh, the Arctic. And and and, and uh, we, we're just going to grow more and more dependent and we're going to become proxies. And this is dangerous because uh, our ability to avoid war, uh, act rationally, uh, have the point of departure pursuing our own national interests and security, all of this will now be reduced. And uh, But again, this, so from my perspective, pro-European means you diversify your economic connectivity, you take responsibility for your own security, you make sure that you get along with your neighbors, all of this, and when, when necessary, find uh, yeah, neutral status. For example, for Norway, we didn't want the Americans and British in our high north, in the Arctic region, because we knew it would provoke the Russians. So we want to be good friends with the Americans, but good neighbors to the Russians. All of this is out the window. So for me, I don't understand how, why this is going under the banner of being uh, patriotic or pro-European. It's it's destroying the continent. Because but again, good against we have evil. a concept, we call it pro-European, we fill it with Yeah, nonsense. good against evil. And this this is why, you know, the, 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 the Scandinavian countries, especially Finland, Finland played such an intelligent, game in this in the cold war uro kekkonen the way that he that he managed to leverage uh you know this this neutrality discourse of finland which was completely different from from other neutralities in the west you know to the point where where western propagandists even called it finlandization but finland played this very well it wasn't sucked into the into the warsaw, warsaw pact it had way more wiggle room itself because it constantly made sure that it provides security to russia but not by threatening the west by actually being 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 a buffer zone and and thereby it was able to to contribute even to the to the cse process very importantly most people forget that the cse was a russian idea but it was sold to the west through finland <laughs> which actually proposed it and five years later you have this great great conference which is the high point of detente and currently all of this thinking is out of the window like um even the swiss are now firmly in the camp of saying like okay let's do a, a peace conference without one of the two yeah. belligerents they think of it as a process i must say though in their in their defense they think that maybe something's going to come out of it let's try but the the basis is this peace formula which is anything but a peace formula which is again just a slogan it's actually an, a demand for russian capitulation which if you think about it rationally will not happen <laughs> so um yeah. well every now and then we arrange these peace uh, peace summits and we don't invite russia <laughs> You know, the one one side in the conflict, and uh, as the Ukrainians always say, oh, this is to mobilize international support against Russia, and the, the, the demand is full capitulation of Russia. So it, it is it's not a peace conflict, but this is why we 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 make up new 
new words. And uh, actually, we have the same is more amusing in this country because we have a policy against foreign bases on our soil, but we're giving now eight or twelve bases to the Americans. So we have to, but but we don't know, we, we don't argue for it. So we call them distinctive areas, uh, which is uh, you know, America's full sovereignty, legal jurisdiction. Uh, they can do what they want there. We don't have access. It's for their military. So it's per definition military base, but we can't call it as such because uh, then we would have to have a debate about uh, whether this is a good idea. So, you know, you make up new words. And uh, so, no, I think it's, um, yeah, the, the Finland thing is also quite extraordinary because they have been such a success story for, for, for neutrality. And whenever we have peace conferences or the big leaders meet, they, where do they meet? They go to Helsinki, Geneva, but, uh, you know, Switzerland, Finland, they're not neutral states anymore. So the Russians don't even want to, uh, them to host these things. Now we're going to have to go to the Arab world or, you know, Latin America or Asia, somewhere else, because uh, the Europeans, the neutrality, which was a key strength, we painted as as weakness that uh, you can't be neutral in the face of evil. Yeah. Again, then not the consequence of this good versus evil. Well, no, no neutrality. Then we're now a part of this. And uh, the thing that yeah. changed is that the neutrals understood for a long time, uh, especially Uro Kekon in Finland, but also Kreisky, Austria, and and a good part of the Swiss. They understood that being assailed, being attacked as immoral, and so on by the West is part of what it is. You're attacked by everybody. You stand your own ground, but you do what's in the interest of the country. Which at this point is not to go into one or the other camp. It is to play your role as an independent actor with them, between them, and so on. And this, in the last 30 years, we lost that because this unipolar moment kind of really kicked us in the butt very badly to the point where we believe ourselves, or a lot of Europeans believe, we have to be on the right side of history, <laughs> right? This catchphrase also is so out there. So we all choose, and then regularly, we regularly choose the wrong side. <laughs> Yeah, but this uh, the unipolar moment. What what may what what makes us so committed is not it's not that it's that we're being disingenuous and uh, merely you know using our propaganda and inventing, inventing it out of nowhere. It has a very powerful foundation, and this is uh, behind the the liberal ideals that if you if you think you can actually transform the world, a lot of this comes from a good yeah. place. You you think you know if you have hegemony, the whole idea is then you can elevate the role of democracy and human rights in the international system. We can transcend the international anarchy. You know, create a bridge from the chaotic world of to now of now to this uh, more utopian of tomorrow. Uh, and this is uh, you know how we I think uh, not representing probably manipulating Kant's idea of a perpetual peace. This is uh, this is a very powerful idea. After the Cold War, the democratic peace will make the world uh, more democratic, more liberal. Uh, we'll all get along much nicer. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is Francis Fukuyama's end of history from uh, 89, that uh, uh, as long as there's a Western hegemony, we're moving towards an entirely different world based on perpetual peace. And uh, so that's why it's important to understand when we see that our hegemon is slipping, it's not just, okay, I guess now we have to share power, like accept that countries like uh, uh, great powers like China, Russia, I would even put Iran in this category now that they are large powers. Uh, we can't base it here on defeating them. We're going to have to find a way of harmonizing our interests. Again, Westphalian system where we balance our interests. Uh, but but we, we but we don't do this because that undermines the whole project we have. We're going to have a new Pax Romana, a new um, you know a new Pax Americana, a, a perpetual peace. It was going to be an entirely new international system. This is uh, this is a huge project, and these politicians they feel they're carrying this on their backs, like they have a uh, almost savior. So, so they they see themselves genuinely as really really good, and if they make a peace with their main uh, allies. The, no, allies, uh, adversaries, then they're destroying this whole project. So, and this is the problem of perpetual peace. It legitimizes perpetual yeah. war because if you if you can end this horrible conflict, uh, problematic world, and create a new one, and all you have to do is defeat your adversary, well, certainly it's worth trying to take down the Russians. Maybe run to on China, of course. I mean, it's a it's a psychotic mm -hmm. <laughs> proposition, but this yeah, is where it's, we're it's, going. It's, it's the same over over and over again. Like this version, you could call it West Man's burden. That's like, oh no, we have to do this for 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 the for the global good, and you're tearing down everything that you've been building, uh, and and the, the very the very piece you're 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 proclaiming to to save is the exact thing that you then like openly support like 
getting rid of with weapons. Stoltenberg, weapons are the way to peace. Whenever you hear these kind of slogans, it should go through your mind that something is seriously off. And, you know, this whole idea of democracy and so on, the way that, that democracies don't fight with each other and that democracies are the way to perpetual peace, this thing has been flawed from the beginning. And even if we go to the Second World War, I keep telling people, guys, please look at Japan. Japan is the odd one out that really, really doesn't fit. But, okay, Italy and Germany, let's let's agree they were horrible uh, fascist dictatorships. Okay, let's agree. But so was, so was the Soviet Union. And Japan, between 31 and 45, 15 years, they had 13 governments. Every year, basically, every, every, every 14, 15 months, another government collapsed. Hideki Tojo was in power for two years. Um, that was not a fascist leadership. They had parliamentary elections in 1942, and those elections didn't go the way that the central government wanted them to go. Uh, Japan was not a good democracy, but it was running uh, according to way more democratic principles. The problem with Japan was that it's that power wasn't centralized. Like the, the army and the navy, they could drag the central government into wars left and right, and then they 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 followed up. And the amazing thing there, what we should have should learn, is that they were the ones who were able in 45 to capitulate. Capitulation is very, very difficult, right? Because you need to align, you need to, to undo the damage that, that you did before with boxing yourself in. Um, the, I don't know if there's a question in what I just said. It's just um, the... Well, uh, well, this is the funny thing with uh, uh, propaganda. Actually, John Mersham, he wrote an article and a book as well, Why Democracies Lie More. But, uh, well, for me, from my perspective, he borrowed a lot of these ideas from uh, uh, former literature, like uh, going back 100 years on propaganda, because it was widely recognized that democracies often become more dependent on propaganda, because if you're going to transfer sovereignty from uh, the head of state to the people, uh, obviously, it's more pressure to move the, to control the public. Public thinking, why, yeah. The main scholars, the main post scholars of propaganda, being Edward Bernays, Walter Lippmann, they all recognized that uh, yes, that the democracies would have more need to control the the the, the, the public, because that's where sovereignty resides. But uh, I just want to comment on on the on, on the idea that the uh, that the power here, yeah, cliche, but, but but power corrupts because you see often this uh, whenever you have an ideology of transcending. Uh, the international system as it was, uh, for example, with this uh, liberal uh, peace, uh, or democratic peace. The, the, the problem is it's always linked to an entity of power. And you see this with all idealist internationalism. Like, look at the French. They're going to have, uh, during the French Revolution, this was going to be, you know, uh, also perpetual peace. But then, you know, it didn't manifest itself. So suddenly they declare, we'll come to the free, all the, any people of the world who's not free, we will come to freedom. And suddenly they ended up with an emperor. Uh, so how did this happen? And you had the same with the Soviets. They also, as I said, they also wanted to transcend the system. But their first uh, idea was so we're going to just, uh, the, one of the first thing we're going to do is suspend uh, pretty much our, not the foreign ministry, but we don't really have a foreign uh, policy because we, we're not going to interfere in, in, in with other states. Sure, shortly thereafter, they're saying, well, uh, we're going to come and uh, liberate the people of the world. And, 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 and you can't decouple it from, from power. And I think this is why you see now the inter internal contradictions building up in the West, because, you know, we have to save the only possible democracy, the only best free and democracy in the Middle East, uh, Israel, so we have to then support a genocide. Uh, you know, we can't compete properly with the Chinese economically, so now we have to militarize this competition. Uh, you know, and of, of course, with, with Russia, the, the, you know, these lies we have been telling in Ukraine, they are so... Uh, over the top and i think a lot of them will start to come more and more out now as well and it's just uh, across the board is the whole idea of perpetual peace is or, or a security system is you find ways of resolving disputes without resorting to force but force is now the number one <laughs> they're always the first uh, tool in the toolbox and uh, we, we never try to harmonize the policies we don't we don't even do diplomacy you mentioned stoltenberg's uh you know, worse uh, now yeah, was pretty much plagiarizing Orwell saying uh, weapons are the path to peace. Uh, you know, we, well, why haven't any leaders for more than two years even sat down with the Russians? We don't have to hand anything over to them, but even sit down and talk to them. 
Uh, anytime we're in the same room, like an OSCE meeting, whenever the Russians are going to talk, uh, the Europeans and Americans stand up and walk out of the room. I mean, this is so childish. Absurd. It's childish. And, uh, childish, yeah. But this is what you see when uh, when uh, the ability, if you create that an ideal, uh, universal ideal, which can uh, essentially save humanity, transcend conflict, and then you link it to, oh, it's dependent on our hegemony. Now you're going to see that these ideals of peace, which are good values, but being used, uh, weaponized to go after other countries. This is what we do. Uh, we create new wars as well. We we don't interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries. We have democracy promotion. <laughs> we don't invade governments. We have uh, humanitarian interventions. We don't topple government. Parliament. We have we support democratic revolutions. So this is uh, as Orwellian as it gets. We just make up new words and fill it with uh, yeah ridiculous content, and uh, no one can criticize it because who who's against the democratic revolution? Who's against humanitarianism? So it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's sloganary. It's not uh, debate and it's not foreign policy. I wonder how we landed ourselves in this, because the fun thing about a liberal democratic society built on 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 trust and the foundations of 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 free speech should be that we don't get there right that we that we keep ourselves in a discursive space where ideas compete with each other and in the end the individual makes up its mind and we see it that's not how it works <laughs> that's not what it leads to <laughs> it's it's really depressing it's very depressing in a sense like you know this 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 idea that, or this experiment started 250 years ago, right, with the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and let's implement that. And this will lead to good societies. And we see it's not leading to good societies. It leads to very similar outcomes as when, you know, king and queen and, and dictator are in charge. Um, depressing. Yeah, but that's why, <clears throat> the, again, <laughs> going back uh, at that point when when you yeah, change what the concepts mean. For example, the Americans, they always had, uh, in the first years, they had this idea of non-entanglement. Non they, they, they shouldn't uh, get entangled in these uh, blocks of military alliances, because this would transform the right to fight wars to a responsibility. So this, they were very much against this. It, but then this uh, became uh, defined as uh, isolation. Yeah, but before it was actually American number... neutrality, 150 years, Washington's yeah. American yeah. neutrality. And that was a sane, like realist approach toward not being sucked into foreign BS. Yeah, and, it and it has all the support from uh, the realist scholars as well, because, you know, as Westphalia suggests, the wartime alliance is, is okay. If you want a power expansion is trying to dominate the great hegemon, then country A and B, will cooperate against the state. But all the real scholars recognize that peacetime alliances is a horrible idea. Uh, you're preventing, uh, you know, and alliance solidarity, which is now also treated as a, some kind of a virtue. Alliance solidarity always has to come first. It's, uh, it has to come uh, yeah, beyond, uh, above uh, national interests at times. And, and and all all the real scholars, not all, but most of them recognize that peacetime alliances is they're, they're very destructive if you want to create uh, a peaceful security architecture. So taking a case from this country, for example, we when the Americans wanted to build missile defense, uh, building missile defense to to undermine Russia's nuclear retaliatory capabilities. In Norway, they were quite concerned, uh, both government and the media. They were saying, well, listen, why, why would we not, just us, by the way, uh, France, Germany, a lot of these countries were worried that this would destabilize the uh, security in Europe. Well, why would you <laughs> try to dismantle uh, this foundational block for security? And uh, and then we had WikiLeaks coming out with uh, their little reports about the American ambassador in Norway. And, uh, and he was pointing out, listen, we were trying to, you know, flip the Norwegian, so they won't uh, oppose us on this missile defense anymore. And the main strategy was, well, if you we frame it as alliance solidarity, because this is uh, Norway's security rests on its partnership with NATO, that's everything. So if you frame this as alliance solidarity, that's a concept, you know, you can't go against. It's a good one. And uh, and then you know, a few months later, uh, it's another cable coming from the ambassador. Yeah, you know, we're... We're now involved with their think tanks, their media. Uh, we're convincing their government, so they're now flipping. So now they will be pro missile defense. So it just shows uh, all you have to do is uh, uh, 
twist the concept, like peacetime alliances, which is destructive for regional peace, uh, and you turn it into something positive, like uh, alliance solidarity. And now suddenly, uh, it, this is the mor moral thing to do. Uh, as Americans would say, you know, we can't be isolationists. Obviously, we have to uh, be the world's policemen because there's no middle thing. <laughs> It's, uh, which is no, which it's, is it's which quite, is why uh, the strategy of the West is very much about narrative control. The Russians and the Chinese don't care that much. I mean, they they have their own narratives, but they n are nowhere near the the level of narrative control that the West tries to play out, in which everything that happens in the war has to happen in the name and for. Uh, the right narrative and and everything has to be spun in order to to sell a narrative in one or the other way which is why we're seeing right now how the west is trying to explain away the 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 defeat of ukraine by saying it's just because russia uh, because china exports too many uh uh, uh microchips to russia and uh, we nobody could foresee that and it's like you know you constantly need to squeeze and and and, and things around in order to make sure that the general public remains Remain, remains on board and it's it's working actually it is working yeah but it's also this uh, they we have to say well the ukrainians will never accept uh, defeat or by bowing to russia this is why we can't have peace negotiations you know they're courageous fighters they will every ukrainian will fight till then and um you know i'm not gonna step on the the, the, the ukrainian army you know a lot, a lot of them are very very courageous uh, you know fighting for their own country that's not my point my my, my, my point is, uh, in order to solidify this narrative, we also have to neglect that most uh, the country most of Ukrainian refugees went to was Russia. We also have to neglect that a uh, huge amount of Ukrainians are now in Europe and they don't want to go back and fight for, for Zelensky. And we now have to, uh, Poles and some of the Eastern Europeans are suggesting, maybe we have to deport them so they we can fill the trenches with fresh meat. And it's uh, you know all these videos coming out of men being dragged off the street out of their apartments to be sent to the front, and it it, it doesn't it's 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 horrific and but it doesn't conform with the narrative so we kind of has to hush hush a little bit so everything has to yeah fit fit with the narrative and uh, but sometimes you see it it clashes and this is the funny part with when we ever talk about Russia it's always this overwhelming threat, which uh, will consume us all, but also there is this whole hopelessly backwards. <laughs> they can't do anything right. So they come and steal washing machines for their chips, but they also have these horrific uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, you know, they can't take a Ukrainian village, but they might take all of Europe. And my favorite is possibly, uh, you know, Russia will, it would never dare to attack Ukraine. It was part of NATO, but we also have to save Ukraine because if they take Ukraine, they will take then, NATO. Uh, uh, they will invade NATO next. Yeah, so there's no there's no common sense anymore. It's, it's just nonsense. It's all as long as it serves the narrative that Russia's uh, very very bad, uh, but also backwards. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, kind of interesting because it's actually taken from a page out of um, you know Victor Klemperer. He was a Jewish Holocaust survivor. He wrote this about uh, uh, Hitler's uh, Germany, where he said that the, the way the discourse of Jews was uh, their inferiority always had a dual narrative. On one hand. They were like despicable, uh, inferior cockroaches almost. So they were uh, disgusted by their inferiority. But also, there were this uh, huge threat to civilization itself. They could destroy all of Western civilization. So you, they wanted it both ways. And, uh, you know, this is, how we do, this is how we do the Russians as well. You know, these people fighting with shovels, uh, all drunk and uh, rapey and retarded. And, but they're also, uh, you know, this huge... Uh, Goliath, who can uh, swallow us all if we don't stay vigilant. And it's. Uh... I'm gonna I'm gonna end with something very polemic, and everybody listening, of course, don't take me serious. But whenever something comes from Europe that starts with N A, then don't go for it. Um, but I'll 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 leave the rest here. Um, <laughs> Glenn Deason, thank you very much for your for your um, time today and your analysis. I very much appreciate hearing sane things. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, it doesn't come much of it uh, these days, unfortunately. But uh, it's good to see you again, Pascal. Uh, thanks. Oh, for everybody, me. Um, Glenn Deason has a YouTube channel. If you want more of this, Glenn Deason's YouTube channel. It's Glenn Deason. It will be in the in in the link below. I mean, it's um, he 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 delivers a lot of great analysis. So thanks for that.